the term has already been used. It's a monumental book, clearly the distillation of a lifetime of research and reflection, and it will no doubt be and remain uh, the to-go uh, synthetic book for uh, some time to come, decades to come perhaps. Um, it is even-handed, uh, it is measured as far as I'm concerned. Now, of course, uh, many people will find, find fault uh, with the book and uh, aspects of the book, no doubt. That's inherent in any book, of course, um, and including this one. Um, there will be many Iranians, especially, I, I would think, will find fault with the way Abbas portrays Vosoka Dole, uh, not as the sort of quintessential uh, villain, the nefarious traitor who sold out his country in 19... 19, but a uh, diplomat with a weak hand to try to make the best of a very difficult situation. Um, no doubt uh, both the champions of Mossadegh and his detractors uh, of the great man will find uh, problems in the description and the narrative and criticize Abbas for having distorted the record. I won't go into these issues in part because I'm not a specialist, also because I'm not really uh, a man of great controversy. Uh, so I'd like to stay away from the worst ones. Um, and most importantly, of course, I'm um, mostly an early modernist, uh, especially uh, focused on the Safavid period in most of my work, uh, at least. Now, to me, uh, it's, it's, I thought the book was a pleasure to read. It's, it's very engaging, it's very accessible, and at the same time it's compre comprehensive. Um, and again, uh, the other thing that I think is very important is that the, what I see as the even-handedness and the fairness of the book doesn't come at the expense of uh, blandness, uh, of uh, bloodlessness, uh, lack of passion. I think it's a very passionate book, uh, and, it, and it exudes that uh, in, in, uh, 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 when you read it. Uh, at least that was my experience. So there are many things I like about the book. Uh, and I, 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 I have to make a special uh, case for the many, uh, the multiple maps in the book. I think that was, for me, that was one of the most wonderful aspects of the book. Of course, it has a, such nothing to do with the narrative and the quality of the book, but so few books come with so few maps. Uh, usually a perfunctory one that's kind of, you know, bland and uh, nondescript. This book has many, many very detailed maps. Uh, that uh, f allow one to follow the trajectory of Shah Ismail I, for example, or the movement of the Germans um, in uh, World War I, uh, Wilhelm Wasmus, uh, or the British uh, Norper Force in 18, uh, 1918 19, uh, all of which, to me at least, illustrate history in a way that can only be done uh, through maps. Uh, so I, uh, I compliment uh, Abbas to the extent that he was responsible uh, for that uh, insertion. Now, there are many other things uh, of substantive uh, value that I like about the book, uh, one of which is, of course, the serious attention paid to the pre qajar period. It's not simply a prologue in the book. Uh, it's a full 150 pages, if you include the first half of the 18th century. Um, and um, uh, the Safavid period is treated in this book uh, seriously, comprehensively, and with great insight in, uh, in my eyes, uh, as a uh, development in Iranian history, uh, roughly speaking, from a tribal formation and all that entails to an urban-based uh, Persian and Persianate-inflected uh, society uh, with the attendant changing role of religion and the relationship between the clergy and the state and so forth. It's all uh, uh, laid out quite well. And again, we can nitpick about uh, details, uh, but I think the overall uh, portrayal is not just comprehensive and engaging and, 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 and um, easily uh, digestible, but also extremely illuminating and informative. And you don't have to be a specialist uh, to, uh, to enjoy uh, the writing and to absorb the information uh, that it contains. Now, what I like about above all about the book, in, in terms of its general structure, its approach, its methodology, um, is that Abbas <laughs> casts it to some extent consciously and certainly unconsciously and under, under the surface as a series of creative tensions and paradoxes, which to me is really sort of the heart of Iranian history. It's, it's this, you know, this, this 
amalgamation of a series of paradoxes that one tries to unpack and that keep, that maintain their enigma and their mystery and their beauty uh, in a way, precisely because you know, a paradox is something that is very difficult to unpack and is never sort of amenable to, you know, A, B, C, and D. You know, there's, there's more going on there. There's, there's culture involved, and, and that comes through in the book. So there are many of those. Um, and, and Abbas uh, positions himself very eloquently and insightfully at the intersection of many of those uh, um, uh, paradoxes and, and tensions, creative tensions. Uh, to name but a few, uh, the battle between... Um, frenzied modernization, late 19th, early 20th century and beyond, and equally furious reaction to it on the part of conservatives, clerics, but not just clerics, very important force in Iranian history, with the question of democracy and popular sovereignty, of course, becoming pivotal during the constitutional revolution and what came out of it, the role uh, the clergy played overall and came to play in the 20th century, uh, and especially as a result of the constitutional revolution. Um, there are many other ones. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention a few more. Uh, one uh, that is extremely important is, of course, the tension between uh, sort of the recurrent theme of messianism in Iranian history, which didn't start with the Safavids, but really acquired sort of a new uh, dimension during the Safavid uh, period, and, and indeed inspired the creation of a state and an enduring state, and animated it uh, for the longest time. Uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a sort of preternatural pragmatism on the part of Iranians uh, that comes out in uh, a beautiful ability to accommodate, again, contradictions and, and variety. And again, this is one of the secrets of Iranian history, and it's one of the reasons, to me at least, why there, we still have a country called Iran, and not simply a number of sort of, you know, uh, fragmented uh, tribal entities that uh, are at war. There's a glue there, and it's not simply language and literature, Shia and, uh, and, 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 and Twelver Shiism. It is also, I think, that ability uh, to live and let live by way of, of finding a balance between um, uh, Tanawu, it's a term, uh, uh, diversity. Uh, and, and I think Abbas catches that quite well. Uh, there is a tension, of course, between, and it's an extension of this, Orthodoxy on the one hand and free thinking. Uh, he also pays uh, ample attention to tensions between uh, the ruler, the Shah typically, and the Grand Vizier, which is of course a trope and a very important one that goes way beyond the uh, Safavids, obviously. You know, the Khan or the Shah, who is ultimately a tribal warrior, he fights hard and he feasts hard, he, you know, squanders the gains, the booty, and the Grand Vizier is the prudent man who has a husband. Uh, the resources and goes to the Shah and says, listen, your majesty, uh, of course you have to throw a big party because you just gained a big victory, right? And it had to be celebrated. And it's also a matter of redistributive wealth. But we have to be careful because, you know, there are signs from the provinces that the rains haven't come this year. And so we're looking forward to a drought next year. So be careful. You'll fill the granaries before it's too late. That, that tension, that creative tension, is of course also quintessentially Iranian, goes back to Babylonian times, to really pre-Islamic times, but it, 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 it remains at the heart of statecraft uh, in uh, Iranian history, uh, really into uh, modern times, into uh, the period of sort of, you know, artificial irrigation, if you will. And again, uh, Abbas uh, doesn't not necessarily spend a whole chapter on that, but he, he, he builds that into the, the framework and into the structure uh, of, of, of his story. Um, so, uh, what else? I have about 15 minutes, about halfway, I think. Um, I like um, very much uh, the attention the book pays, and this is not a given at all in books about Iranian history, to the physical environment, uh, which is uh, a complex and complicated one that provides and throws up many barriers to easy transportation, to trade, to the... Uh, conveyance of commodities that leads to a situation where you might have a famine in one region and wealth and abundance in another region region because they're separated by high mountains. Uh, uh, all of that is oftentimes either forgotten or overlooked or sort of taken for granted by many people who write about Iranian history. And it's absolutely central. 
I mean, nature and the environment isn't destiny, but without it, I think you end up with a disordered picture, especially when it comes to a country like Iran, which half of which is uh, not given to arable uh, uh, land and, and, and is barren, uh, either fearsome deserts, Dash to Lut, Dash to Kavir, or the Zagros Mountains. Uh, so, you know, agricultural areas are the oases and areas in between, and the western part, and of course, Gilan, Mazan, Deran, and so forth. But that sort of patchwork has to be kept in mind, really, again, until the modern period, and even today, uh, as we see in the case of climate change uh, looming. Uh, and again, Abbas does, I think, a good job uh, in, uh, in bringing this out. And the results, you know, the, 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 the fearsome droughts that plagued Iran and the famines that killed uh, hundreds of thousands, up to a million people each time in 1860, 61, seven, early 70s, into the 20th century. Very important part uh, of the history, whether you like it or not. Now, five minutes about the drawbacks, and they're very relative, you know. Uh, I should emphasize that. Um, there is a, a great deal of attention in the book to uh, sort of, again, a creative uh, tension between uh, the center and the periphery, but to my mind, not enough. Uh, in other words, the book is written from the center, for the most part. Now, that's not necessarily Abbas's fault, because, of course, that's uh, where the, the sources take you. You know, it's very hard to find a, a balance. It's almost impossible to find a balance in mo until modern times, certainly until the 19th century, between the capital and the outlying provinces. You know, for the Safavid period, we have chronicles from Kerman and from Yazd, uh, from actually two from Kerman, quite in abundance. Uh, but still, you know, most of the official information comes out of uh, Esfahan in 17th century and so forth. So how do you turn the tables? How do you write around uh, against the grain? Is very, very difficult. Um, but, you know, I would have liked to see, for example, more attention paid to Ala Verdi Khan and his son Imam Khuli Khan, who basically ran all of southern Iran, the Garm Sir, all the way to the entire Persian Gulf coast from Kurbule, Iluye to, uh, to, to what is today the border of uh, Baluchistan, I mean Pakistan, Baluchistan, uh, qu uh, quasi independently. Uh, they were as rich as the Shah, and they were serious competitors until they were cut down by Shah Safi in the uh, 1630s. I would have liked to see some more attention paid for, uh, to a similar fief of Zelu Sultan in the 19th century, who ran a similar type of, you know, big chunk of Iran semi-autonomously, uh, or even autonomously in, in a way. He's mentioned, and I looked him up in the index, uh, but, you know, in a somewhat perfunctory way. I would have liked to have a discussion about, again, that, that balance, the tension, how the center relates to the periphery and how the periphery uh, finds power or the, how its power diminishes uh, in, uh, according to the, the, the strength and the weakness of the center itself. Uh, because I think that's also an enduring element in Iranian history. Um, I would have liked uh, to see um, some more attention paid uh, to the remarkable resonance of the Safavids, the legitimizing force of the Safavids in the 18th century. I didn't see much of that. You know, there's a famous article by Perry who talks about how the Bosmo and the Gaon, you know, the ones who survived the massacre and the fall of Isfahan in 1722, uh, managed to retain a great deal of legitimacy. How the name Safavid retained that, that call and that resonance far into the 18th century. I didn't find any of that, because I think that is part of a building block of the continuity amidst all the turmoil and the disruption and the dislocation of the 19th century. You know, that would be one angle through which we can see a certain type of continuity. Uh, and I think that a little bit more could have been made of that. Um, uh, the, um, um, uh, let's see, couple, let's see, a couple of things more. Uh, yeah, you know, four more issues that are slightly more uh, comprehensive, that run through the book uh, at large, if you will. Um, methodologically, uh, uh, methodological issues. Uh, there are traces of triumphalism in the book, I think. You know, I think you make a conscious effort to get away from this Iran as Kurji Kabir Ta Shah Pahlavi, or, you know, whoever you want to see as the end point of the Azamat Iran, this Iran Javidan, Iran forever, eternal Iran, uh, which, of course, modern historians necessarily have to get away from in order to be taken seriously by their colleagues, 
and I think you do a good job, but there are moments when it sort of kicks in, maybe subconsciously. And I can't blame you, because you're an Iranian and, you know, you have to pay your dues, so to speak. Uh, but it's just something that struck me, you know, the, sort of the revival of Iran notion, uh, if you will. Uh, and, and, and by the same token, a slight lack of an ex explanation what that really meant that glue and that, you know, persistence that we still have in Iran after all the invasions, all the turmoil, all the dislocation, the secessionist movements, the rebellions, the different languages and so forth. Any other country would have disappeared from the earth, the face of the earth. Iran is still there. Uh, so, anyway, uh, next to last point. <laughs> Um, I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not done. I'm not done. That, three more minutes. Um, 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 more seriously, yet more excusably, perhaps, um, I, you get, you get to the heart of the uh, to part of the heart of the power structure in Iran, but. The part that is not well developed and that one could not well develop at this point in 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 our state in the state of the scholarship is you know this notion that power in Iran ultimately resides yes in the Shah in the local Khan but as part of a network an ever changing network through Musa Herat through you know sexual politics you know uh, marrying with adjacent tribes in order to solidify power and so forth, you know, the thousand families, uh, that idea. And I think that's actually what the next generation should get into, mapping that whole story and also over time, because you see these families holding power in provincial cities like Kerman, Yaz and so forth, for hundreds of years, the same people are seeing the same core. Uh, and, and I think it's vital for an understanding of how it really works, sort of the capillary element of power uh, in order to do so, we really have to get into this network system. And, and uh, little work has been done, but not enough yet. Uh, so again, that's not really a criticism. Um, now, the last one is that, um, is Iran in the world? Which is one of my own, you know, uh, ways of approaching Iran. I rarely, or I tried at least, not to place Iran as a self-contained unit. But I look at Iran and interaction with the world, the adjacent world, the near abroad, and the farther uh, world. Especially after 1500, it, it's ineluctable to do that. But even before that, you cannot just talk about Iran, because again, you marginalize yourself as a historian in the larger profession of historians. Especially in this day and age, where everyone is talking about transnationalism, and you don't have to follow every fad. Uh, but Iran is simply not a self-contained unit. No uh, man is an island. No country is an island. So there is not enough in the book uh, about that. Yes, you do have a section about uh, sort of the high volume diplomacy on the Shah Abbas uh, against the Turks under Clement, Pope Clement VIII. You know, the part that's brought about by Steingart uh, quite well. You know, you have this whole sort of, um, uh, the, 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 the whole series of, of envoys coming and going. Um, and then it stops. You don't put it in a larger framework. You know, this is, of course, part of a much larger paradigm that really starts at least with the fall of Constantinople in 1453, if not before, you know, the fear of the Turks and the attempt by the Europeans, Christian Europe, to find allies in order to stem, contain, and, and, and push back, repel uh, the Turks. And, and Iran, is, it's not well known that Iran played a pivotal role in that, uh, but you know that. Uh, and that story also continues really into the 18th century. It diminishes in vigor, but it really only ends in the 18th century when, you know, the Turks become weak and no one, you know, they're no longer a threat and a challenge. So that, I, I would have liked to see a somewhat larger story develop uh, rather than sort of an episodic few uh, paragraphs. Um, now, um, uh, again, uh, well, I have two more points, very briefly. Um, uh, with regard to foreigners, and so it's an extension of what I just said, Iran and, you know, adjacent countries, or Iran and, and the world, so to speak, there's relatively little, too little to my mind, uh, about Iran's embeddedness in the larger Islamic world surrounding it, uh, its relationship with the uh, Mughals, 
which of course is getting a great deal of attention these days, uh, even beyond Iranians migrating to India in search of work and fame and reputation and so forth. Uh, but certainly vis-a-vis -vis the Ottoman Empire, which is very consequential. Of course, an arch enemy, but very intense relations, sorry, diplomatic, uh, commercial, uh, uh, gift-giving, uh, and so forth, uh, and simply exchange of, of, of goods, services, and, and information, which continues over time. And simply the Ottoman Empire is an entity out there cutting Iran off from Europe, to a large extent, which is, of course, one of the reasons why the oceanic route is being developed and nurtured and fostered and encouraged by Shah Abbas, among others, um, uh, I think uh, would have warranted a few more, um, you know, a little more narration and, and elaboration, I should say. Um, um, and then the very last point, uh, which is, which always puzzles me, and, and I had hoped to find something uh, in, in the book, and there are... There's an occasional remark, but it doesn't hang together at all. It is the, 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 the puzzling um, uh, phenomenon of the large numbers of Iranian upper class uh, people and their tendency to ally themselves to the foreigners. In the 19th century, the British and the Russians doing their bidding, taking their money, becoming clients, offering services, access to the court, and so forth. Something, by the way, which is not at all limited to the 19th century and the British and the Russians. You find it in the 17th century when the Dutch come in. Um, and I think it needs, it requires, it's in part a painful subject from a purely nationalist perspective. And yet it requires serious inquiry uh, before we can begin to understand the development of, you know, a sense of self among Iranians that ultimately becomes nationalism. You know, and ultimately leads to this notion that this type of behavior is khianat. In the 19th century, it wasn't necessarily khianat because everyone was in, engaged in it. Not everyone, but you know, <laughs> enough people. And so, I would have liked to see some kind of pointers there, some kind of awareness that this is a topic that is very important, that is sensitive, and yet needs more investigation. And that's it. Right. Thank you. Thank you.